Yeah. Go for it. We going? Great. Uh, yeah, my name is is Derek Johnson. I'm a composer and an electric guitarist and an educator. And uh, I can say honestly, I'm probably the world's foremost expert in the music of the Swedish metal band Meshuggah. And the album that I brought to talk about is Catch 33. Uh, I, uh, I transcribe the music of Meshuggah. Uh, there's a really, I was at a Steve Reich talk, um, and he said something that's really nice. There are two types of music. It makes it very simple, right? There's notated music and non-notated music. Um, I trained as a composer, and I've spent a lot of my life uh, you know, being very involved in classical music. But uh, my background is, uh, where I grew up, my formative experience with, with music came in metal, uh, came in thrash metal and death metal and uh, all the stuff that was happening through the 80s and early 90s. Um, the, the story of Meshuggah for me, oh. Are you picking it up, Julian? Yeah. <laughs> they, they just got the clue. Yeah. Okay. okay, we're good. Yeah. Sorry, oh, no, it's we fine. No, we didn't lose much. Yeah, of course. Um, so Meshuggah. Yeah, uh, my, metal. yeah my, my coming into this band actually, uh, and this particular album, uh, is, is part of a really important story of how I, uh, how I process and, and love music. Uh, I had a really formative experience with metal growing up, and that's how I, in a way, how I learned to play music, although I was always studying classical music also. Um, and I, I, it's really interesting. I think I went through these brief exclusionary periods, and I think this is something that a lot of people who love music engage in. And it's important in a way, but uh, I started college as a jazz guitarist. I thought it, I was going to devote my whole life to that pursuit and uh, kind of turn my back on metal. And I fell backwards somehow into classical composition and uh, you know, went for years and years devoting myself to that, completely engaging in that, and getting this kind of, uh, we were just talking about this, uh, this kind of elitist attitude where the music I like is the greatest music in the whole world. Uh, and it happens a lot in all sorts of genres. And it's really stupid, <laughs> like horribly stupid. Uh, so it was when I was, you know, like, I think I started the, you know, doctorate in composition, and I had been away from this core acoustic, this music that I loved, this whole genre of metal, and uh, you know, progressive metal, really, uh, really uh, uh, impressive stuff. <laughs> and uh, some friends told me I should check out this band, Mashuga, and I checked them out. And I remember it was 2001. I was at this uh, the Aspen Music Festival in Aspen, Colorado, studying composition, and I heard this band, and it represented so much of what I hold dear, the, the sheer sonic power of distorted guitars and drums and bass, and, uh, but also this extremely refined uh, compositional language, uh, and especially this deeper exploration of rhythm that blew my mind. So, I became kind of obsessed with figuring out how the music worked. Uh, like so many bands, it's non-notated music, and I decided that I wanted to get deeper into it and started writing it down. Uh, and essentially, it felt just like composing, where you're discovering how this thing works, uh, and getting so deep into the structure, and also the whole composition. And I started doing this over the years as kind of a side hobby. And it was in 2005 that they released this album, Catch 33. Um, I finished my doctoral recital, and I took, I think, well over a month transcribing it working on it nonstop, just like I would when I was writing. And I run hours, 12 to 18 hours a day, and take a nap and, and keep at it. Uh, 
and so I had this incredibly deep, immersive experience, uh, initially just learning the guitar parts and uh, learning the bass parts and, and putting it all into notation. And I have the score from that period. This is 2005. So it's kind of a rough draft of the complete album, which is uh, really special in a, in a just from their output and in general, because uh, it's a concept album. They designed it as one track, and it's uh, about 45 minutes long. So it's big form. And there are a lot of precedents for these things, you know, prog rock albums. Uh, even the second side of Abbey Road, I see, is this big touchstone of this, let's do a bigger thing. Uh, and it's a very composer brain thing to do. So, yeah, it's a fantastic piece of work. Um, something that's really special, too, in this experience is this is, you know, when this transcribing thing really took over my life. And, uh, and it eventually got me in touch with the band. I made the score and wrote a little letter uh, and sent it over email to a friend who was in Paris, and my great friend Guilherme Carvalho, Brazilian composer who lives in Paris, and uh, sent him the score and said, print some out, go to the show, give him this letter, just give it to anybody you can. And uh, when Meshuggah finally came to the States supporting the album, uh, I went up to their merch guy, who turned out to be the drummer's cousin and later became their lighting designer for, for a while, and explained who I was, and very nice, and, and he said, oh, you're that guy, you should come back. Uh, so, and that started uh, this ongoing collaboration with the band, who have been really supportive and, uh, I have to say, very patient as this project has uh, kind of exploded in the strangest of ways. Uh, I've continued now since this album. They've put out two other full-length albums and uh, a bunch of work before that. And I've transcribed, uh, at least in draft form, uh, nearly all of it. But uh, there's still so much work to be done, and it's, it's uh, kind of ballooned into this project of making an iPad application where all the parts are notated uh, in extreme detail, exactly what they're playing, exactly what's on the album, and it'll give the user a chance to listen to the band, say this is the drum part, and uh, they can listen to the band, loop sections, play things slower, uh, and I'm actually in the, in the midst of beta testing it, and as a result, I'm learning how to play drums, the extreme Swedish death metal way. Uh, I've been doing it for now like a, a year and a half, and it's destroying my life. Uh, all the things I should be doing, email, uh, staying in touch with people, working on other things, composing, practicing guitar, uh, it all gets pushed to the side as I uh, learn how to play this, this music that I'm so engaged in. Um, and it also, it takes me deeper into the, into the structure of the work. This album, Catch 33, is really, it's so ambitious and so interesting and so well composed. What I realize with this band is that they do all the things that I hold dear in any type of music. Uh, they make the most out of very uh, simple, <laughs> quote unquote, simple ideas and find a way to develop those ideas throughout the whole course of the piece. Um, and it, when, when a composer composes like that, and especially does something that's more ambitious on a large scale, I think the listening experience is, it becomes more and more intense. Uh, it's a, just a different thing. So, yeah, this beautiful album, it's, a, it's an entire world. And now I've been living in this world for, uh, for years. And it's, it's so strange, but uh, so beautiful. And it's been a great pleasure to, 
to have their support and um, like this summer I, I got to go to Stockholm for another performance and, and got to go to their studio and we spent time editing, uh, you know, putting in every bend and slide on the guitar parts and making sure that you know, everything is, is totally correct. And uh, Frederick, the guitar player, is taking me on a tour of the studio and showing me the rooms and kind of offhandedly he's like, oh yeah, in this little room, this is where we did Catch 33 and, and we set up cots here and we basically lived here for <laughs> you know, uh, months and months, and uh, in this like little flash, this little moment, there's this common experience that we both spent so much time with this record. <laughs> you know, them making it, and and me uh, in a way remaking it, transmitting it into this other format, and uh, internalizing it by learning how to play it. Uh, it's been such a thrill. And uh, now, it's pretty recently I've been returning back to Catch 33 and finally editing the drums, which is super interesting and also shows exactly how the band really are composers. Uh, Catch 33, unlike any other album in their output, has programmed drums. They uh, built a, a, a very beautiful piece of software as they're uh, really a way for them to compose, just like composers use notated music. So they programmed the drums, and this project was so big and so ambitious, I think they just said, it's going to be way too much of a pain in the ass to actually record these drums, and I think it, uh, it would detract from their process of actually figuring out the big picture, the long line. So. I've been learning the drum parts now, and now I can learn so much quicker, and, and the notation just streams by, and I start at half tempo, and uh, <laughs> after all these years, oh God, it's embarrassing, it's like eight years later, finally I'm sitting there and learning the drum parts, just like I learned the guitar parts, uh, and soon I'll be able to play through the whole record, and it'll be uh, <laughs> a great way to spend a Sunday. <laughs> uh, yeah, fantastic though. But it's, it's changed my life, uh, this contact with the music, um, this deeper immersion. And uh, now everything I do, the way I play, the way I compose music, has been touched, transformed, and uh, very much uh, made better by by this crazy work I'm doing, notating the music of Meshuggah. All right. I hear you telling the story, and I see this glow in your face. <laughs> yeah. And this is, this is metal, this is blank metal. Or, uh, it's, I mean, it's, yeah. I'd say it's just metal. Well, it's, it's metal, yeah. It sounds uh, closest to death metal. You could say it's progressive metal. Yeah. Uh, but actually now I just say it's metal. And when I explain it, especially to like classical musicians, I say it's the Palestrina of metal. Palestrina is the, the greatest composer of the Renaissance. Like Bach in the Baroque, he became the model of the most refined technique of, of, of writing polyphonic vocal music. And uh, yeah, Mashuga is like that. I feel like it's the most refined. Uh, part of the, the genre, that it really rose up and, and did this, uh, this thing in a way better than anybody else. That's, and that's what I want to kind of focus a bit more on that, is just that, is this, why this one? Why this, because in terms of like the, the, the classical element, because you're, you're very well studied in, in classical music. Yeah. And that when people hear, they think of metal, and you think of black metal and death metal, any of that, it's, it's very, it's, it's very it's, polarizing. And it's um, amazing. But the way you're describing it, you, you think of it, you don't think of it in this really abrasive, crass sort yes. of way. Yeah, and actually that brings up another thing. I don't know if I really got to express this, that, you know, this idea of spe specialization and, uh, is just garbage because every, every type of music, you're going to have this, these certain artists, these certain voices that transcend the genre, where 
I'd like to think that anybody who is fairly uh, open-minded and a, a, you know, a good listener <laughs> uh, could say, wow, that's really good. Um, you know, and there are all the, these, I don't know, the, the names that stick around. And in classical music, of course, it's the, we have representatives from all the eras. But really, music changed fundamentally along with technology and the way we can record it. Um, it started probably in the late 19th century where composers started being aware of all music. Like Brahms had complete editions of early music that nobody really knew about before. We become, uh, we have the opportunity to look back and see all of history. And no matter what the style or genre, there's going to be stuff that's really, really well done, <laughs> you know, and quality trumps all. But that's another reason why this band is so important for me, is that it made me realize that quality isn't exclusionary. And that finding that music and enjoying that music that, uh, that transcends uh, in, in every different style and genre is so wonderful. It, and yeah, yeah, that's a really life-changing uh, realization. It's kind of a pain in the ass, too, because I, I listen to so much music, and I love so much music. <laughs> but as far as Meshuggah, it's a joy because, surprisingly enough, I never get sick of this music. <laughs> you know, I'm in the car hours a week, and I can still just listen to the whole record and be like, oh, it's so good. <laughs> wow. The thing is, like, people almost like put these on two polar opposite ends on a spectrum, but at the same time, when you put something on two opposite ends, they're almost very similar in that respect. Yeah. Tell me about that in the sense that, like, you know, I think about like in terms of like an ideological spectrum. You know, people who are far left are almost like conservative to a certain extent where they kind of come together. Yeah. Um, well, the, I, the way I look at it is that it's always been this way that uh, especially, I mean, using composers as a model, I can be kind of a representative of that. You know, composers were always interested in what was going on and always took that influence into their music. Mozart dug Turkish music and wrote some jams on, <laughs> you know, on Turkish stuff. Uh, Bartok, you know, one of the great composers of uh, early 20th century, and Stravinsky both took folk music of their native lands. And, um, you know, and Bartok really was the first ethnomusicologist. He'd go out into the hills and collect gypsy folk tunes and transcribe them and find that th they had this great rhythmic quality. And that completely transformed his compositional language. Uh, uh, my year the bar talk of metal. <laughs> yeah, basically, I mean, that's, <laughs> no, that's, I mean, that's kind of what I feel. I feel this is my, this is my research, and uh, it's like going out into the wild hills and, and studying the music of the gypsies. Uh, only they're more like, uh, you know, Viking men. <laughs> they're super duper nice guys, uh, and really a pleasure to be with. Uh, yeah, and very humble and, uh, and very conscientious of, of what they're doing. Um, this, this changed your life. <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I mean, I know it sounds like a little extreme. Oh, no, it's say, absolutely I mean, like, true. This, this is like, this took you on a whole different direction. This took you to like, you're like a junkie. <laughs> it basically, like you, you just needed that. You needed, you needed that drug. You like, right? You went on well, like no, I mean, like music is my uh, my life, absolutely. And I, I devote uh, my attention with the same kind of uh, uh, crazy, obsessive, uh, total immersion. Um, so it's the same thing that happens when I'm composing or when I'm learning uh, new pieces or. Uh, yeah, it's that, that obsession. Uh, it's, yeah, it's my life. But this is one among many. But I have to say that it's, uh, it's really stuck. <laughs> Eventually, the transcriptions and the app and everything is going to be uh, out there for, for uh, the record. <laughs> and uh, I'll be writing books, too. Um, 
But uh, did you see this happening? Did you foresee this journey? Mm-hmm. I mean, like. Oh no! I mean, like I would have never have guessed. I mean, in a way, it's kind of a drag because there's only so much I can do, and I've. Uh, Although I do engage in all the projects I do with this same kind of crazy severity, it's uh, by devoting so much time to this, I know I've sacrificed, especially the time I should have spent composing or could have spent composing. But um, there's a lot of time left. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be doing all this stuff my whole life. You'll see another sugar when you're 70? Yeah, I'm probably finishing up the work, <laughs> you know, uh, especially the analysis. The, yeah, I mean, I haven't gotten too technical about the, the, what makes Meshuggah so interesting is this very refined technique in handling polyrhythm, of handling uh, uh, this, well, very, put very simply, all their songs are very conventional in the sense they're all in 4-4. Four, four. And uh, usually there's a snare on three. So there's always ka, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. But the riffs, the patterns that cycle over this 4 4 space are not 4 4. Uh, and they get into uh, very strange lengths. And as they loop, that means that when you're listening to them, they're, they're always different, even though it's always the same. And that's a beautiful idea. Uh, and the way they do it, you can exist in both these worlds, the large symmetrical world and then this also cyclical asymmetrical world. And uh, it's such a rich listening experience. And it's, what I really love about it is it's so audible. Um, whereas a lot of advanced music, uh, contemporary music, uh, there may be all these neat things happening in this great revolution in rhythm, like uh, so much has happened in this one parameter of music, rhythm, in the 20th century. But uh, uh, a lot of times you can't hear it because there's not a beat, there's not a regular, there's not a constant that's uh, audible. And in Meshuggah, the asymmetrical world and the symmetrical world are both so clearly projected that you can happily exist in both these worlds. And uh, it's, really, it's really fun for your brain, and it feels good. And uh, it's uh, just, yeah, super incredible experience. And the, really, it's the, con- the intent and the execution are completely in line. Uh, it, and that's really great. <laughs> you know, that, that's the dream, uh, especially as a composer, to say, like, wow, could I have a perfect realization of this piece? And they figured out a, a way to do it. One last question, and then I'll just... Um, you make it sound as though that classical music and metal are much closer than what one would think. And everyone would think that they're, they're completely different. And in, in, in ways they are. Mm-hmm. But the way you describe it, the way you talk about it, the way you break it down, you make it sound like th- there isn't much difference between the two. Yeah, but I'd take it much further than that, that there's not much difference between uh, music of all genres. Uh, I mean, really, and that's kind of, I love this idea of, like Reich said, of there's notated music and non-notated music, and both have their advantages. If Mashuga knew classical notation or were studied in that, it would probably be a real drag because what they do doesn't fit very well into that language. So they found, a, they found their own medium to, to write and compose. And it's the same way in, in all world music, uh, African music, uh, Balinese music, uh, that you can, and with bands, in all genres, that you can develop this incredibly refined music uh, outside of uh, using notation. You can also <laughs> do the other. The, uh, yeah, it doesn't matter the, the tools. It really comes down to the, the quality. 
And since we started making music, I think we've always had a, a, a bent to get, to get more refined, to make the best music we can. Um, in w using whatever materials and tools and process uh, there is to be used. And, I mean, that can be, that applies to all genres. <laughs> you know, there's, there's good music being made at, you know, really at the highest level in, in every genre. Yeah, thanks. Wait, Derek. Yar!